Hello, and welcome back to Winter's Tales here on Aaron Sound. We were continuing the story we started last week, a uh, rather grown-up, and frankly rather eerie adult fairy tale called Dance Beneath a Scarlet Moon. You might recall that this story takes us back to Aaron in the year 1919 with James and Heather Holgar arriving on the island for their honeymoon. They met when James, having returned from the battlefields of the First World War, was nursed by Heather in Glasgow. They travel now to his uncle's holiday retreat, high in the hills above Whiting Bay. In an accident with their horse and trap, sees them completing their journey on foot, while down below in the fairy glen, their coachman, Hugh, has a strange and deadly encounter. Soon after, there comes a fierce rattling in the door of the honeymoon retreat. A frightened young woman struggling in out of the night. James hurrying out to check what might be lurking in the dark. He fires a shot. Bang! But there doesn't seem to be anything there. He returns to the house, oblivious to the fact that his stray shot in the dark has accidentally killed the coachman who had struggled, struggled with his dying breaths all the way up to the house to give a warning about well, what was that final word of Garrick old Huey breathe. <gasps> And now, episode two of Dance Beneath a Scarlet Moon. James rapped hard at the door several times before Heather's ghostly outline flitted into view at the far side of the frosted glass. As she unlocked the door, he stepped through, declaring, <laughs> There's nothing out there. Nothing and no one. Some silly island girl, and silly island girl should know better. Saw a shadow in the dark and panicked. Uh, where is she, by the way? She's upstairs, said Heather. Upstairs? But the way she was shivering, James, said Heather. Cold as if, as if she'd climbed out of her own grave. I tried to warm her by the fire downstairs here, but that, that just seemed to make her shiver all the more. And that dress she was wearing, well, well frankly, James, it, it was all she was wearing. And it was damp, damp with sweat or, or with whatever burn or mud she'd been struggling through. So I got her upstairs and, well... My bath water was there, still steaming hot, and I, I, I stripped her off and settled her in it before she shivered herself to death, poor girl. I am a trained nurse, you know. Uh, well, yes, yes, he said, of course. And she's uh, all right now. She seemed a, a little calmer, at least. Then you came hammering in the door, and I had to rush downstairs and leave her. And you think we can, uh, get rid of her? Rid of her? asked Heather. Well, it, it is our wedding night still, he reminded her. And we were making such a, such a point of, of having it all to ourselves. Well, I, I'm not sure how I'd feel about her, but sending her back out into the cold and dark, said Heather. It's a big enough house, surely, that we can find somewhere to put her for the night. That's a big and kindly heart you've got, my darling, he said. Would you be here with me now, if it wasn't, she said. I dare say I wouldn't, he said. Anyway, I've been out in the cold too. Will you take care of me for the rest of my life, she said. That ought to be long enough, he replied. They embraced. They kissed. A sustained moment ticked its way past on the mantelpiece before impulse made them press 
closer still, only for Heather to to f flinch back sharply. What, 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 what's that there? She asked. What? Oh, oh, that. Oh, he said, reaching into his great coat pocket and drawing out his service revolver. Uh, a wee bit of uh, extra protection against the uh, the non-existent bogles out there. I thought I heard something like a shot, she said. Well, you did. If there's nothing out there, well, what did you shoot at? At nothing, darling. At shadows and rustlings in the bushes. And, well, maybe a bad memory or two stuck at the back of my mind. Oh, James, don't worry, he said. My future is suddenly looking much, much, much more interesting than my past. I'll uh, put this away, shall I, with all the other relics I'm overdue for getting about. And then, well, we can uh, maybe make a start on this feast Mrs. McCrae has assembled for us. Uh, start, at least. And he started up the stairs. In his dressing room, he uh, drew the revolver out again and shoved it disdainfully to the bottom of his suitcase, then tugged off his greatcoat and went to hang it up. That was when he noticed the connecting door between the dressing room and the adjoining bedroom was still open by the narrowest fraction. Warm firelight glowing beyond. After a moment of staring that way, he found he was listening past the low crackle of the logs in the bedroom fireplace for some sound from the young woman his wife had left in the bathtub. He heard nothing and had to shrug off a sense of being almost disappointed by that. He had gone to the mirror to comb his hair when he did hear something from that other room. Something far removed from anything he might have expected to hear. The girl, in her familiar lilting voice, seemed to be murmuring to herself. And what he heard her say was, Johnson, the blood came in scarlet blossoms. Young Charlie, it was like fire was bursting from his veins. Simpson, he turned to smoke in an instant. James was starting, haughtingly across the floor to that connecting door. Jamie, with a squint, saw his legs shot off, she went on. Des Devlin died with a joke into the deepest dark. The dark was dark red. He wrenched wide that adjoining door, strode into the bedroom, cried, What in the name of God are you talking about? The young woman, all but sunk in the bathwater, stared at him but said nothing. Her stare reminded him where he was and he uh, uh, blushed and backed out of the room. Downstairs, he found Heather setting up a little candlelit table for them to eat at. All right, darling, she asked. Uh, yes. Yes, he said. Oh, you didn't go uh, blundering into the... What? what? Oh, no, no. No. Yes. Yes, I, I, accidentally, uh, just for a second, darling, well, it is our bloody bedroom and our bloody wedding night. 
and the, the, the fleeting glimpse of her I got wasn't enough to stop me wishing she'd leave us at the earliest possible opportunity so I can get on with loving my new wife like she bloody well deserves. He caught hold of her again, but she discreetly steered him towards the dinner table. In the meantime, she said, we ought to at least eat some of this feast. I mean, before it gets any larger behind our backs. And who knows, you might need to uh, build up your strength for later on. He sat down and began eating his way briskly through anything she set out for him. He was on his second plate of, um, of smoked salmon and bannocks before the young woman drifted downstairs into the room. The damp lengths of her black hair, hanging about the shoulders of the white nightgown Heather had left out for her. The linen clinging about the frame beneath in a manner that rather called out for the uh, addition of a dressing gown. Though there seemed something to the way she moved within and scanned her eyes about that genteel interior. Truly like some forest creature that had strayed over their threshold to suggest they ought to be grateful she was dressed at all. She dragged up a chair, sat between them, cast an eager glance either way and then began grabbing handfuls of food, piling them on a plate for the most fleeting second or two before um, stuffing the morsels in her mouth. Uh, you've uh, got over the shock you had out there, ventured Heather. Shock, shock, she said, mouth still full, crumbs tumbling from the, from the edges of her mouth. Out there, said Heather. Something frightened you. Uh, uh, I, she said, uh, pausing to at least halfway swallow what she'd eaten. I uh, fright me bad. What was it? asked James. I went out and looked and I couldn't see anything. I will, she said. Uh, you wouldn't, eh? Because nothing was there in the first place? Because uh, you don't have the sight, maybe. The sight? The sight for seeing them things. What things? asked Heather. You know, the, the woman said, spirits, uh, bogles, glaistigs, the she and all that sort of thing. She, she said Heather. Uh, my wife is from Glasgow, said James. The Garrick isn't common currency. Uh, the she, darling, are the, uh, well, the fairies. Oh, said Heather. Uh, fairies, other things too, the young woman went on. Spirits, bad things. One of them came at me in the woods out there. I've got the sight. Always had a, a curse my mother tell me. But at least with the sight you can see them things coming. There's nothing out there, insisted James. Nothing but some rather bright and beautiful moonlight. But I dare say you could clean that plate and make your way on wherever you are going quite safely. Why, well, I'll, I'll walk your way along the track if you want. You're one of them soldiers, she asked, changing the subject. Uh, soldiers? Uh, yes. Yes, I was. How did you know? The coat you put on. Them markings on it. You were at uh, yon war they had. I was. And now the war's over. And I'm here to enjoy my honeymoon with my wife, starting with our wedding night, which uh, happens to be tonight. It's lovely you could join us, but uh, doubtless they'll be expecting you wherever you were going out there when the bogles pounced. And they were to go, she said. And know the night. Well, you must live somewhere, Heather suggested. It's it's a way a way over the other side of the island. She said, "I'll, I'll never get there, there tonight, knowing that dark out there." So, what were you doing out there in the dark, on our side of the island? James queried. I tell you, I, I, I was running. I, I was frightened. We can't let her go back out there," said Heather. "Not tonight, darling." James began. "You're kind." 
the young woman said, laying a hand that had, seconds before, been snatching at slices of ham across Heather's nearmost hand. I'm, I'm sort of trained in it, said Heather. Trained? I was a nurse. Were you? His nurse, said the young woman, tilting her head to stare directly at James. How did you know that? asked James. I didn't know, she said. That's why I asked. We can set up a spare room, said Heather, surely j just for the night. Uh, I don't need no spare room, the young woman said. Yon couch over there should be good enough. And it'll be warm down here with that fire. A yon roar it's got on it. I'm sure we can accommodate her that far, said Heather. Looking to her husband, c c can't we? We can uh, cast a spare blanket her way, I suppose, he said. And wave her off in the morning. So long as she uh, doesn't get in the way too much. James, Heather chided. Well, you hardly know I'm here at all, said the young woman. There's so much we hardly know about you, said James. Not even your name. My name, she frowned, taking a further moment as if having to rack some recess of memory to find the appropriate answer. Shona, she finally said. That's my name. And find a blanket for her, they did. Spreading it out on that lengthy couch, leaving the fire burning as James and Heather retired upstairs. Shona wished them a good night, standing by the hearth, stretching out her palms to soak up the heat. Clicking shut the door of the bedroom at their back, Heather stepped to where James stood silent in the glow from their own fireplace, wrapping her arms about him from behind. You didn't sound terribly uh, hospitable down there, darling, she said. She, uh, she said things. I heard her say things up here earlier. Things she, uh, she couldn't have known about. About, about, the, about the war. The war was all over the newspapers, darling, for four years about my war. Oh, it, was, it was nonsense she was talking, but nonsense? Then why fret over it so? Haven't we got more uh, important things to be getting on with? He turned to face her. Yes, he said. Yes, we have. He embraced her, kissed her with a kind of, a kind of fury at all those things that had kept them from kissing one another so fully over the preceding year. The long, slow grind of his convalescence, the prejudices of his family against their courtship and engagement. The everyday puritanisms of a society content to have young men in their millions blast and bayonet and shoot apart one another's tender bodies, yet wholly uncomfortable with any show of physical tenderness between an unmarried man and woman. She eased him back, stepped away. She had been unsure in her inexperience of the uh, strict procedure of a wedding night, had pictured some slow and civilised change into night attire, an approach to one another as ordered as the taking of partners for a formal dance. But now, alone with James, as she had never been alone before, alone with a masculine wireness, and need she could feel simmering at every pore of his frame she knew something less studied was called for. There, at the edge of the firelight, she undressed, shuddered, and then undressed further, as if discovering her own nakedness for the first time, and then stood there, waiting for him to do the same. 
and he hesitated. And she reminded herself of how very, very wounded he was. And she reached out to that woundedness with as much strength as that moment could lend her, leading him into his own bearing of a more fragile self. The fragilities meshed, strengthened, tumbled across the bed and for the longest, sweetest moment it felt as if this wedding night would marry them more perfectly than any ceremony in a draughty abbey. Her own fears were swiftly dispelled by delight in the very things that she had feared. Here, after all, was a strength in her freshly discovered where she thought a, a vulnerability might have lain. And yet, in James's skull, images were catching light and burning between him and the sight of his new bride. Images invoked by a few muttered words from that other woman Downstairs, that woman who had come out of the night, a stranger holy, and murmured of sights he had never shared with anyone, least of all with the wife he loved. Johnson, young Charlie, Jamie, the others, the blood and flame. He'd seen them dissolve into the stink and the dirt that was all that had been left. And the blood he himself had set flowing, spurting, staining. Yes, as the girl said, like, like red flowers blossoming from other lads. Just as gormless, just as far from home. Falling upon them sometimes as intimately as his woundedness now fell about his wife. And he wondered again at his imposing the stink of all he had seen and done and suffered upon her here, here in their marriage bed. Couldn't she, a nurse after all, catch that, that scent, that stink of open wound? He could. That Belgian mud and its bloody puddles seemed to stretch all around this lover's bower till it felt as if those invoked ghosts were clustering solid at his shoulder. And he asked himself again, more fiercely than he could at that moment cherish Heather, how that girl downstairs could have seen them like he was seeing them now. He rolled aside, curled tight upon himself, suddenly cold amid the fire's heat. Heather stretched a delicate hand his way. Darling, she began. Are you, am I, he said. Am I what? The husband you deserve? Not just at the moment, plainly. Sorry about that, Tara. I'll make an excuse when I can think of one. She tugged the bed covers up about both their bodies. There's no excuse required, she said. Well, we've both had a, a long and demanding day. We have a whole week to ourselves in this beautiful house on this beautiful island. Plenty of time to, to get used to one another. I'm more than happy to spend that time with you, husband. She touched his uppermost shoulder lightly. He shrugged off her touch. As if her sympathy was the worst humiliation yet. Feigning a swift fall into sleep he wasn't, in reality, remotely ready for. Heather turned away. It was all right. 
she understood. Hadn't she seen up close how wounded he was? Didn't she know professionally how deep the wounds ran in these noble warriors? Hadn't she learned the patience such spirits required? So to feel any twinge of disappointment, still less a, a deep churn of sadness, was unfair, she knew. And so she found her own deep pocket of sleep, exhausted sleep, to huddle in before any such feelings in her could sour the moment further. James waited until the distinct rhythms of Heather's breathing suggested her being asleep. And then he uh, slipped from the bed, tucked on a dressing gown amid the glow of what were now embers in the fireplace. He stepped downstairs, drawn by an impulse to perhaps, yes, step outside, breathe in a little fresh night air, maybe smoke a cigarette. And then it occurred to him that useless old Hugh, the coachman, had not shown up yet with the remainder of their luggage. Drunk the old fellow was, probably, down in Lamlash, their things still abandoned with the damaged trap below in the fairy glen. He thought of dressing and wandering down there himself and fetching the cases in person. Thieves, after all, were rare on the island as fairies. So doubtless the luggage was still there to be retrieved. But then he caught the sharp crack of a log burning in the reception room next door. And a lingering fury in him at the intruding presence which had soured the sweet honey of this dreamed of evening set him stepping through through into that adjoining room it was dark there dark save for the low scarlet glow from the dying fire he edged into the teeth of that glow, given that it was the one spot in the room where he might just about be able to see where to set his next step. Even so, he stumbled against a low table, and a voice from the dark responded with a call of, Careful. It was the young woman's voice. Shona's, or, or whatever she called herself, sounding from the stretch of crimsoned blackness, he knew to hold the lengthy couch where she lay. You might injure yourself, she said, more than you're injured already. And what would you know about that, he asked. She shifted upright on the couch. A little of that ruddy glow caught the edge of her slender face. It was so beautiful. It was like a shard of ruby glass on which she might have cut a finger there in the dark. Oh, but of course, he said, lighting a candle on the mantelpiece with a match, from his dressing gown pocket. <sighs> you have the second sight, don't you? I see what I see, she said. Her beauty, its long dark hair, the sharp stab of those wide black eyes, the porcelain smoothness of her face and of her body within that wisp of nightgown all shimmering further into view in the flickering candlelight. Sometimes it's ghosts, I see. <laughs> ghosts, he snorted. Don't spit out the word like that, she said. You there, you've got ghosts all around you. I see them. 
I hear them. The ghosts of them fellas whose names came to me upstairs. When I was in the bath up there, their names and the pictures of the things that's happened to them. Well, not their, not their real ghosts, maybe. Those are maybe away over in France or somewhere closer to what they called home. But the ghosts are their ghosts. That's what clings to you. I've seen it before. Many a time. Men who've been to war. They drag so many ghosts around with them. You know, you don't know what you're talking about, he said. I know the man you've been, she replied. I see the things he's done. So frightened of being a ghost himself, he fell on others so fast to make ghosts out of them. I smell the blood. Wasn't there blood? Of course there was, he said. It, it, it was a war, after all. And you... You breathed that blood, drank down that blood, felt your heart dance swift with that blood. Nonsense, he said. You're talking nonsense. Drank it? Danced that? I, I was rigid with terror. Who wouldn't be? I, I killed, yes, because, because like any poor common soldier, I, I knew the moment I hesitated. The poor bloody common soldier on the other side would overcome his fear and lay me dead. So yes, yes, there was blood. And sometimes, God help me, I was glad to see it was the other fellas and not mine. And the more of it came out of him, the safer and the happier I felt. Like it was champagne spraying from the bottle. Shameful, I know. But staying alive never felt more important. Why be ashamed, she said, of being alive, alive and hot as blood itself. She rose from the couch. The blanket slipped away from about her. She stepped towards him. He tensed as he had sometimes tensed when inches away from a death in cold mud but it was warm there very warm Shona's skin gleaming in crimsons and pinks in that firelight as she drew off the white nightgown Heather had given her get, 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 get away from me he said weakly why she answered because you're afraid Afraid of me? Yes, he muttered, backing aside a step. It's not me you're frightened of, she said. You're frightened of being alive, of having your blood at the heat it knew back there when you were birthing all those ghosts. She caught his hand at the wrist, drew it towards her. How warm. How hot indeed her soft skin felt as his palm settled upon it. The ghost of that heat is still there in you. I sensed it the moment I saw you in that cold quayside today. You've locked it up. Hid it from that wife of yours upstairs. For fear you'd scare her away. I tell you again, I'm not scared. Set it free, for blood, wild blood, is a thing I know how to dance with. Leave me, leave me alone, he said. You're a soldier, she said. You could fight me off. He found himself kissing her, and fiercely she wrapped her arms about him. And together, together they plunged into that deep red firelight where it lay deepest of all on the hearth rug and somewhere in the back of his mind 
scarlet flowers blossomed amid barbed wire and ashen bodies. And there we leave our tale for this week. It hardly needs saying that things are going to get even more dramatic in next week's episode of Dance Beneath a Scarlet Moon. I'll see you then. Thank you for listening and pleasant dreams. <laughs>